Well, thank you. Um, we're here for a keynote panel on the transformation and, and transformation and emp empowerment, looking at open education and professional development. And we have a huge panel. And so rather than me introduce each one of them, I'm gonna ask the panelists to start uh, by introducing themselves and ask you introduce yourself. If you could say your name, uh, your title, what organization you work for, or with, and also the professional development program that you've created. That will be really helpful. Uh, so let's go in this order of Sarah, Jenrin, Lena, Quill, and Tell, and Tanya. And then um, we'll pick things up from there. So Sarah, would you like to kick us off? Thank you so much and welcome everyone. It's so exciting to see some familiar names and to see some new names. So this is very, very exciting way to connect with all of you. Thank you, OE Global, for the chance to participate. Uh, my name is Sarah Cohen. I'm the Senior Managing Director at the Open Education Network, um, all, also known as the OEN. Uh, the OEN runs a series of leadership development programs. That's at, at the root of what we do um, for our community of um, institutions. Um, specifically, we run um, institutional transformation through open education, um, and that's through leadership development, often for staff, but often um, we see more and more with faculty members and administrators, which is exciting. Um, and then we also run our certificate for um, OER librarianship. Um, this is, we just closed our applications uh, on Friday. So we're in the midst of going through that um, and are welcoming our third cohort for this seven month program um, that really connects people with um, mentors, a community of peers, and um, obviously a, a quite a bit of instruction that results in an action plan um, for people to take back to their institutions. Um, and then we also run a series of publishing, um, OER, uh, pardon me, open textbook publishing initiatives that also support leadership development. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sarah. Jenrin? Hi, and thank you for having me. I'm really so, so glad to be here with you all and glad that um, Open Education Global could, could host such a wonderful um, multi-time zone event. So my name is Jenren Wetzler. I am the Assistant Director of Open Education at Creative Commons, and it is my pleasure to get to focus on open education globally. And specifically, I get to manage the CC Certificate Program, which trains uh, educators and academic librarians in open licensing, in Creative Commons licenses in particular, and how to work with other open licensed materials, and then also how to um, engage in these different open communities that we have online. So in, in education, in open access, and GLAM, and more. So currently we have these two courses. Actually next year we're going to be debuting the CC Certificate for GLAM, which is a, a training program for galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Happy to talk more about all of this and the kind of initial results that we're seeing from these training programs um, so far, but I, I will see the the floor to fellow panelists. <laughs> sure, Lena. Thanks so much, Paul. And thank you so much to my colleagues um, and, and to you, Paul, for having us all together. My name is Lena Patterson. I am the Senior Director of Programs and Stakeholder Relations at eCampus Ontario. And I come to you from Toronto, Ontario, which is the traditional home of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa and the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat and Toronto's Treaty 13 uh, territory. Um, and this land acknowledgement is important to me um, in my privilege as a settler and, and this practice reminds me I'm accountable to these relationships. So it's such a pleasure to be here uh, with you all and, um, and eCampus Ontario has been invited to, to speak at this panel because we run a program called Ontario Extend. I'm just going to drop um, the link in the chat there, which is a professional learning program that is grounded on the key skills, knowledge and attributes that people require to teach and learn in, in a digital environment. So the primary goal is actually digital fluency. Um, and so some people in this program might be asking, okay, well, what does that have to do uh, with open education? 
we actually use kind of the concept of digital fluency as an on ramp into conversations about open education. So the, the program has six modules, um, teacher for learning, technologist, collaborator, experimenter and scholar. Um, and the sixth one is curator. And it's through that kind of skill um, and, and kind of set of uh, attributes that we use to introduce people to the concept of open education, start to talk about um, you know, how you find resources, how to kind of analyze those resources and how to integrate them into your teaching. Um, Extend itself is an open educational resource. It was created through open practice and built upon the work of other um, open educators. Um, just to name a few, Simon Bates, the Associate Provost of Teaching and Learning at UBC actually developed the model that Extend is based on. Um, he openly licensed, licensed it and that allowed us to take it and build our program on top of it. And then the team at eCampus Ontario led um, then by David Porter, um, massive contributions from many Canadian open educators open education practitioners that you all know, um, Terry Green, Alan Levine, I'm counting him as Canadian in, the, in this one, um, Valerie Lopes, and then recently we've partnered um, with Wayne McIntosh and Claire Good in New Zealand um, to kind of do a transition of the program. So it's got its roots in open education, it's got its roots in um, in the open community, but it takes a little bit of a different approach um, to how we how we talk about professional development in um, in the open field. And that's that's it for me. <laughs> Quill, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so my name is Quill West. Hello. Um, I am an open education project manager at Pierce College, which is in Washington State. Um, and um, I'm actually here representing a project called Re Regional Leadership in Open Education. And Arlo um, has an arm of our work called professionalism. Um, so rather than develop professional development programs, um, Arlo is actually trying to get an understanding of what is available and what is needed in the field, um, meaning the professional field of open education and the many different roles that people play within open education. Um, and the reason why we want to do that is because we're trying to um, both look at opportunity gaps within professional development in open education, but also trying to help people who are trying to get a sense of how to do this work, where they can learn how to do it. <laughs> um, because right now it's such a diverse and um, dispersed system of professional development across the world. Thank, Thank you, Quill. Very meta. <laughs> um, Tell, over to you. You're muted, Tom. Hi, Paul. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I am uh, a professor at uh, the University of Brasilia here in Brazil, and I have the UNESCO Chair in Distance Education. And uh, well, I'm, I'm here because of uh, uh, the Open Education Initiative, which we have in Brazil since 2017. And we have, uh, I'd say, three major programs for professional development. One. Uh, that we, we started just uh, now. Uh, this We have a first cohort of, of teachers in basic education, and uh, we're running an open education leadership certificate. And the idea is to uh, come up with a, a good cohort of teachers, about 200 of them, that will become leaders in their regions and spread the word about open education. It's sort of meant to be a, a push on, on uh, Google and Microsoft certification, so we have an open leader. Uh, we have a program for higher education, which is called uh, an OER ambassadors program. That's uh, happened for about two or three years, and they're uh, listed in our Ministry of Education site. So we have uh, OER ambassadors all over the country in higher education that can help folks uh, with open education in their institutions and their regions. And the last one is uh, something we run uh, with uh, institutions and, and governments, which is uh, the open policy game. And uh, it's, it's sort of a, a way to get people thinking about how to change internal policy. 
That's awesome, Tel. Thank you. And uh, Tanya, nice to see you here. I'm glad you made it. We were wondering. Thanks. We're just doing intros right now, Tanya. So if you could just give us um, your name and title, the organization you work with, and just a little short introduction to your professional development initiative. Sure. I work with Spark Open Education Leadership Program. It is an intensive year long program designed primarily for librarians who are interested in starting open education um, leadership initiatives on their campus. But now we've expanded it beyond librarians and we've included other people from campus and state leadership positions. And the, the program is primarily, um, we have a intensive 10 week, um, what is open and kind of goes through all the modules about open education and then the second semester is an implementation time when you have to actually do something and implement an in, in um, an initiative on your campus or in your community. And then we've graduated 64 students and we're in our fourth year. So very exciting. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, well, thank you all for these kind of like intro to your professional development initiatives. Um, there's a lot to unpack there, and I wonder if we can do, maybe I'll call this a lightning round, really short answers of just the origin for your initiative. How did it get started? Yours has been going for a while, Tanya, so, so why don't you go first? Tell us what the origin of your initiative was. Um, I was working with Nicole Allen back in 2017, and she was flying all over the place. <laughs> this is real. Um, she would be every day somewhere. And I'm an online educator and I have a background in online teaching. And I said, you know, there, we can scale this. You don't have to fly everywhere and do keynotes for everybody individually in person. We can find a way to scale this so that everybody can get all of the information they need and learn from um, open education leaders, right, teachers in an online and distributed format. So um, we worked together and I designed the curriculum. Uh, it was pretty basic at first and it's grown over time, um, but it really came from that place of not wanting to wear out these amazing open education leaders like Nicole, who were putting so much effort in and I just didn't see that it would be a sustainable situation for anyone to continue all of the in-person um, teaching. And little did we know that COVID would arrive. <laughs> <laughs> we have to have effort. online <laughs> courses. So now we're yeah. sustainable. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Tell, how about you go, how about yours? How, what was the impetus for getting it going? Oh, we can't hear you tell. So for us, it was uh, uh, trying to find a way to to act, in, and, and this will sound uh, maybe bookish, too bookish, but it's kind of true. It's, it's trying to act, oh, maybe you got a bit of a delay. It's it's trying to act uh, systemically. So we, we were trying to find out what some of the problems were with professional development in higher education institutions. And, and we noticed that we, we needed to do some research. We needed to find out what was going on. And then we noticed there were some policies that we were advancing, but that there was an incredible need for professional development. And we wanted to create something in the scale of Brazil that would be able to take the load off of, of us having to, to do professional development over and over again and to sort of uh, give other people the opportunity to, to continue with this, with this work locally and, and to do it better than we could, uh, considering the diversity that we have in the country. And so a lot of this, this effort in, in creating the leadership program and the ambassadors program is to say, we can't obviously uh, handle uh, workshops. Great. Yeah, there is a bit of lag with you, but that's all right. Tell I'll get used to it. <laughs> uh, Quill, wh what was the motivation around looking at this from your side? So um, I have two motivations. And I think the first started with um, 
the Arlo team, the Arlo leadership team getting together and saying, so we don't want to be a movement, we want to be a profession. Um, and so what does that mean to be a profession? But the real reason why I think this work is incredibly important to me is because when I started in open education, I was the only person I knew with a full time job that was open education at an institution. And I looked around and said, how do I do this job? Can somebody help me? And everybody went, we're waiting for you to tell us how to do it. <laughs> and, and so I was like, okay, I'll figure it out. And so throughout my time doing this work, um, I thought, okay, it'll get better for people. And then I realized not that long ago, maybe you know, two years ago, that there are still people who are getting hired to do open education work and looking around and going, how do I do this job? And our answer is, we still don't have a unified way to tell you how to do that. <laughs> so my work is really about inviting new people because otherwise doing open education is about who you know rather than what you can find out. And that creates opportunity barriers. Thank you. Lena? Yeah, you had me reflecting, Paul. Um, so, I mean, Extend, Extend was created in 2017. And it's interesting because it came out of a funding program that we did um, as a province. So the provincial government put some money into the system. It, it was a competitive process. And the results that came out of that demonstrated that there were some institutions that were able to really capitalize on that funding and that there were others that did not have the capacity to do that. Um, and so we we went into the into the process with a couple of key principles. We wanted to lift all boats. We wanted to have a low barrier to entry. We wanted to create something that was shared, um, and we wanted to build interinstitutional collaboration so that capacity became something that we had as a province, not that certain institutions had. On their own, and so eCampus Ontario, um, as some of you know, is a is a consortium of all the colleges and universities in the province, and so we have to we we bring a systemic perspective to everything we do, um, very much like what Tell was describing, and so that's where it came from. Um, that really simple need to kind of level the playing field and make sure that we created something that was. Um, that was that could be either done by an individual so it's you know you can go through the program self paced on your own at any time or something that could be picked up by an institution integrated into their teaching and learning center and run through their lms or and this is the 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 version that we have the most success in is it's run centrally and it, instructors come from all over the province and participate in a facilitated process Jenman? Sure. Well, I, I feel like I could actually turn the question around on, on you, Paul, <laughs> since the, the CC certificate was actually Paul's brainchild when um, when he worked at Creative Commons. But from my understanding, the, the certificate emerged from a growing need that we saw in the US, but then also around the world for open licensing expertise at different institutions. So in the US in particular, I know there was a Department of Labor grant for about Two million, no, two billion dollars that um, that institutions got, and then um, were faced with um, open licensing requirements on their grant-funded resources, but little expertise on how to how to actually open license their resources. So um, the certificate was a way to train up more experts in different institutions and. That, that needed area of expertise. And um, since then, we've seen it, it kind of grow and morph. So I think the, the original area of focus was, you know, addressing a very specific need, but I think now it, it's kind of blossomed a little bit more, which is a lot of fun. Nice. Sarah? <clears throat> um, gosh, uh, it's so exciting to hear from everyone. <laughs> um, at the OEN, I think uh, we were, we had a professional development or leadership development program that was stemming with our members. Um, and like uh, Martha pointed out in the chat, actually, she, she pointed out that, um, that you, you know, jealous that you have a position to work on open education and our community of members um, would keep reaching out 
saying, we're going to be hiring or we'd like to hire someone for open education. Do you know anyone? Um, or can you help us with the job description? And it started to bubble up so much that um, we essentially like like we tend to do in the OEN is look at our community and say, this sounds like a need um, within our community um, for some way to help people kind of apply to those positions or to create kind of those benchmarks for open education librarianship. Um, and we uh, sought out input from our community uh, using our members. We had, we were very fortunate to have some real um, incredible people to help us develop that program um, based on what they knew they needed to go from kind of a project mindset into a program. How do you think about this programmatically instead of this, we're going to, as if it's going to be finished. Um, it's right, it's a journey, not a destination. Um, so I think, um, you know, we, we really looked for something that would um, provide a deeper dive and that would also continue to support what we think is, is essential is, um, you know, talking to each other, that it's not one person that gives you this input, right, or tells you what to do. It's actually, there's so many ways. So the cohort model was really vital to us and, and reaching into our community and encouraging people to create community around open education. Thanks, Sarah. And yeah, I mean, one of the things that I was excited about with this panel is how the emerging, um, op you know, open education professional development programs kind of show a maturation of the field. We've been all doing this work for a while. It's growing. How can we enable those who are getting involved to acquire the skills and knowledge to do this work effectively? And, and so it's, it's, it's wonderful, I think, that there's a mix now of professional development opportunities people can access and use to get those skills and competencies that they need. Um, one of the things that, I, that I'm really kind of keen to hear um, you all address is um, in the context of Open Education Global, which is this conference, we're addressing a global audience. And I wonder if you can speak to who takes your professional development program, like who are the people that actually sign up? How many people would you normally put through um, and, and what's been sort of the, the scale, I guess, that you've been able to achieve either regionally within, you know, whatever regions you're working or, or even internationally. And maybe I'll start with you, Sarah, this, this would be interesting. Okay. Um, well, I, I will say that um, the certificate in OER librarianship is not limited to our members, like most of the OEN's program. Um, we actually opened it up um, because we wanted to be able to support people that are not uh, members, but any, anyone who needs that level of support. Um, we were originally funded through an IMLS grant, the Institute for Museum and Library Services. Um, and so our original, um, the, our first cohort was US, uh, was, was US, and I, gosh, I'm trying to remember how many were in the original cohort. I'm so focused now on the current cohort. Um, this year we, um, we allotted 64 spaces um, for this year's cohort, but uh, we saw many more applications than that. So we're in the midst of evaluating if we can grow the program. Um, and I'll say that we, we typically do, we are still focused primarily on a US audience that we did open it up and say that anyone can attend, but knowing that the curriculum and in particular, um, the licensing, the way that we cover open licensing is US centric. Um, but we've actually received a number of international applications from people who said, we understand, but we still want to participate. <laughs> yes, yeah. um, hmm. So I think that's an area where we still have quite a bit of work to do. Our, our work right now is actually on trying to welcome and invite applications from um, traditionally underrepresented um, institutions and um, communities within the U.S. Um, specifically tribal colleges, HBCUs, 
Um, um, so we're, we are really trying to, to focus um, our energy in that way, um, less so the international um, at the moment. Work Very still good. to be done. <laughs> yes, dreams. Um... Uh, Jenra, and so I know your program actually is kind of more more global in its orientation, and and I'd be curious to hear you talk about that as well as the ways in which perhaps some of the global parts of the world have localized it or built their own version of it. Sure. Well, first, just echoing um, Sarah's note about um, the kind of continuous, not challenge, but area of opportunity for us to always expand offerings to meet a, a broader crowd. Um, th this is something that um, that we focus on as much as we can with the, the certificate, which is global. So, so far after launching in 2018, we have, um, we have graduated about a little under 800 participants from 50 countries. Um, I think about a thousand or so have run through the course, but not all have graduated. But we've been able to expand the, the number of, um, of countries involved and participation options through scholarships. So we've had about 25 countries um, then represented through our scholarship um, participation and um, a number of folks drawn into adaptations, translations, audio options, and, and so on. Um, which really then helps us extend the reach to additional audiences too. So um, like, um, like my, my colleagues, we have our, our options online, which are all CC BY licensed, um, but we're also um, making certificate content available in Arabic, in Italian, soon Burmese, Yoruba, Bengali, and then hopefully Spanish. And then, then we'll broaden the, the scope a little bit to include hopefully um, all of the UN languages and so on. We'll go where there's you know, an, an audience <laughs> for this. Um, but yeah, I think the having some incentive for different participants to one help us focus on the content, making sure the content applies in, in their local countries, having participants help us with different remixes so they can lead workshops in their local communities based on their needs that they know much better than we ever could, um, or adding local case studies to our, our existing uh, CERT content. Has really has really helped, and then I mean the the language translation is huge. Recently, one of our cert facilitators, um, Jonathan Poritz, translated all of the content into audio recordings, which is also extending our reach to, to new audiences as well. So, it's it's kind of a horizon toward which we continuously work in terms of broadening access and um, opportunity for non-native English speakers and non-North American audiences. Thank you, Jenrin, and thank you, Cable, for posting the links uh, related to what Jenrin was just talking about in chat. That's super helpful. Um, and Lena. So, Paul, the question was about, I've gotten about, so distracted by everybody's responses. <laughs> oh, right, it's about um, the participants, about, right? Yeah, who, who's, okay. who's been taking it? Yeah. Um, what, how broad a uh, reach are you enabling? I know your right. primary focus really is the provincial system of universities and colleges, but, mm -hmm. but I also know that even your program or maybe especially your program is also generating global interest. And so if you could speak perhaps about the initial deliveries within your sort of purview and then what's been happening lately. Sure. I think that'd be interesting. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was for Quill and Tal and Tanya as well. Um, <laughs> so, um, I mean, the, the, so first of all, the people who take it, you know, it's 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 very foundational extend. So it's not it is not tied to a specific role in education, um, which means that we have instructional designers, ed, teachers. Um, educational developers, librarians, um, graduate students, all sorts of different people take the program um, and for different reasons. And it is designed to be uh, totally flexible. Um, so it's broken up into six modules. And so if you just want to take the one module, you can do that. Um, so there is no kind of start to finish linear path. You can move through the content in a way that works for you, um, which opens it up to different people with different interests. Um, so we have a very 
diverse, diverse group. Um, it, we have over 900 um, extend educators that we have that have participated in the program in Ontario. Um, we also issue um, digital recognition um, in, in the form of a badge to people who create, who complete. So, you know, it is a process to submit evidence. You submit your evidence upon completion um, and that is assessed. And um, if it meets the standard, then you um, receive a badge. And so you can get a badge for any of the one modules or those accumulate into a capstone badge. So we've issued over 450 badges um, since we started. Um, in terms of internet, so that's in Ontario. We count the Ontario numbers because um, that's, our, that's our jurisdiction and that's our reporting requirement to government. Um, but we are really interested in, in collaborating with, with anyone who's interested in adopting the EXTEND program. And um, I put in the chat a link to the presentation of my colleague, Lindsay Woodside, that's happening right now uh, in a parallel session that features a video from our colleagues at Otago Polytechnic and where they talk about the process that they went to to kind of import the program and adapt it um, for their needs in New Zealand. And so we're kind of using that as a, as a really good um, model of practice that we highly recommend others follow um, because our data, while the program is open and, um, and you know it's out there and anyone can take it at any time, what our data suggests is that completion is very, very closely tied to facilitation and support, especially local support. And so if you're going out there and you want to, you want to do this for real at your institution, at your system, um, we highly recommend that you reach out to us and contact us so that we can kind of help um, and collaborate with you to talk about what's involved in actually making it making it a success. Um, so, so there's a little bit of a gap there between just, you know, the content is free and openly available and what we have learned over the years is actually the difference between people making use of it and being successful um, and that community that you build around them and the supports that you provide I'm sure as all of these people um, nodding no like that's the thing that gets people through right and so um, that's what we're really focused on so I recommend anybody who's interested please go check out the um, Claire Good um, talking about what they did at Otago and that'll provide you a really good uh, point of reference to start with I'll leave this session, everyone. Go over to that other session. <laughs> no, don't do that. Don't do that. Check it out later. Uh, yeah, yeah. Quill, do you want to talk about this? This maybe may, may or may not be relevant to your initiative. I don't know that it's as relevant to our initiative because yeah. our work is really about collecting what all these wonderful folks are doing. Sure. Okay. Um, Tanya? Can you address this topic of like the re the reach of your participants and the potential global nature of it? Sure. So I would say that the people who take this course um, are really looking for a very intensive, ongoing, year long implementation. Um, I describe it as kind of like a graduate certificate program for people who are really interested in becoming a Quill West and becoming a Sarah Cohen, <laughs> becoming a Jenrin Wetzler and Lena Patterson. As well. So it's for people who are really looking to lead in their own institution. There has to be um, a certificate uh, certification and a signature from their um, supervisor saying that they'll support this person in the work. It's meant to implement um, a six month or longer ongoing uh, campus plan. And Amanda's correct in that she said um, there's there has to be adaptation in the program. So where we really um, customize it to people is within their capstone initiatives. So like the first 10 weeks is very, you know, you have to learn this content. It's very important that you know all the basics. But once that time is over, we match you with fantastic mentors like Regina Gong, and all kinds of wonderful people who come in and help you implement your own capstone and people um, create their own special flavor. Honestly, I would say that I, I thought I knew what people would do, you know, like the traditional um, grant program for faculty or something like that. They've gone way beyond anything I could have ever imagined. And every time we get a new cohort, I think, 
I've seen it all, everybody's done it all already and they go beyond it again. So that's where it really, you really see the customization. Fantastic. Tell? Big lag time. So uh, uh, on our end, I think the most sort of global project we have over these three is the, is the open policy game because we've translated into Spanish and, and English and uh, it's been played locally here in Argentina and Peru and Cuba and uh, it's been played in Poland and now it's going to be played in Spain and Slovenia. So, you know, people are using it as a way to get uh, uh, you know, people that really haven't thought about open education before they sit, they play the game in their organization for a couple hours and they kind of get a sense, you know, technical, pedagogical, legal challenges. And it's, it's available. It's an actual board game that you can print out locally and cut and, you know, it's made by game people. So it's kind of a fun way to, to, to get started in this discussion. It's, it's got, has, has gotten a good reach. Uh, locally, I, I'd agree with everybody that, that uh, creating the, the, the networks and establishing this community is, is definitely the hardest part, especially if you don't have any funding. To keep it going, you know, sustainability is also is always a, a challenge. But uh, we we now have 75 students in this open leadership program here in Brazil, and we'll have 150 next year. Another two offerings, and our ambassadors program we had it was more like uh, what was just mentioned now it was like it was a one year course, uh, you know. And so we have these 30 folks that are I think fairly knowledgeable about OER. They had to implement. Uh, you know, some training in their institutions about uh, open education, at least licensing and formats and discussing these things. So they, they, they've had a chance. That's great. And yeah, that's so fun that the, the game version of open education is sounds very appealing. Um, well, look, panelists, I warned you all I was going to ask a particular question and now I'm going to ask that question. So the question is, what are you most proud of? <laughs> and Atal, why don't I stick with you still and maybe you can answer that first. I think, you know, for people that know me, they, they know that I always say the same thing is I think I'm, I, I wouldn't use it as proud, but I'll frame it in, 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 in your language, because I think it's better than mine. Uh, I think I'm proud that we do so much with so little money. <laughs> uh, it's, it's kind of a challenge to work uh, on, on open education in, in a region and in, in a country that we've sort of fomented from the ground up. Um, it wasn't an agenda item. And We've had a lot of really great successes with a very small crew um, in, in, a, in a fairly large level. And it's, it's, it's very hard to keep things going. It's just it, we're trying now to, to get other people involved as much as possible because it's very hard to keep it going. And so I guess, I guess I'm proud. And I think this is even if you have, you know, in a position for open education like some folks do, it's, it's normally not a huge crew. I mean, o, OE Global is not a huge crew. I mean, we're, we're not. We're not very big in any dimensions. And so uh, the, the things that we do, I think have, uh, it's kind of hard to measure sometimes the impact that we have, but. <laughs> it's true, OE Global is not a very big crew. Although I think, uh, I don't know about not big in all any dimensions. I think over COVID we've all been getting big in one dimension <laughs> with um, eating more than normal. Um, uh, Sarah, how about you? Could you take this one? <laughs> oh, um, I'm not, I, well, I guess I'll say, I mean, I'm, I'm proud of so many things that, um, the OEM community has, has done. I mean, I feel like we've grown so much over the last you know, four or five years now. And I think that what the certificate program has, has made me so proud of is seeing the ways in which people really want to take action at their institutions that, you know, I mean, it's a lot to learn. Open education, I think we forget 
Um, I think we talked about this on one of our planning calls, but I think we, people that have been in this space now for a number of years, it's almost like you forget how much it is to almost wrap your head around. Um, you know, we joked about our legal department, for example, um, you know, will be like, what is this, what is this CC stuff you guys are talking about in here, you know, that's written into all of our stuff. And, you know, it's, it's educating so many different aspects of the institution. It's not just the individuals, it's the organizations. And those organizations are made up of so many people that just don't, are, are wondering what, you know, what are you talking about? What are you trying to do? Um, and I think that I'm so proud of the, the people that have helped inform this program, that have taken this program, that are, that are going to take this program, I anticipate. Um, the advances that they're going to make, not just for their students, which is nothing to laugh at, but it's also, it is about institutional transformation. It is helping organizations and people imagine another path than closed off or just us. Um, and I, I'm proud of that. I think that's really what we're doing. Um, and we're doing it together. It's a community. It's an effort together. And I'm, I couldn't be prouder to be a part of it. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, systemic change, I think, is an interesting part of all this. Um, Tanya? So I have to just give a shout out first that one of the biggest proud moments is just that two women got on the phone and figured this out together. I'm really proud that I was sitting outside the ice skating rink on the phone with Nicole Allen and we were dicing this through. What could this be, right? Way back. Um, I'm also super proud that it has evolved so much since that time that we have listened to so many people who are here on this call. We take all of your advice. We take all of your input, all of the improvements that our students suggest. We have taken it all and, and improved it. So it's, it's a completely different thing now because of all of your wonderful input. But the thing that makes me ball, <laughs> the thing that makes me like, if I died tomorrow, I would be so okay knowing that these outstanding students like Abby Elder and Will Cross and the people who are out there doing things they're getting promotions, they're getting new jobs, they're defining the field, and they have gone way beyond what I ever imagined. Like, I see those students up there, and I just am so, so proud of you. So um, oh. thank you for all you do. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. Jen Ren. Um, This is kind of analogous to a couple of the, the points already made, but I'm most proud of our facilitators. They're really incredible, very driven, intelligent community members that really um, kind of embrace this spirit of collaboration and sharing in, in open education. And I think their, their passion has really ignited the, uh, the rest of the participants that run through our, our program, which is so wonderful to see. So I actually had a one quick example of this just to, um, just as a slight aside, since it involves Spark as well. So um, I guess I'll, I'll start with the, the Spark alum. So from my understanding, Carrie Gitz was a Spark participant um, go, going through the leadership program through Spark. And as her culminating project, she, um, I think she created a, an OER training for Austin Community College audiences. So Tanya, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, then she ended up, um, I think, overlapping professionally with a CC participant who's now an alum, Judith Sebesta. So Judith said that because of her, her facilitator's um, spirit of, kind of collaration and one-on-one um, -on -one time, he spent so much one-on-one -on -one time giving her um, particular attention to her work and so on, she not only had or developed more um, expertise and, you know, confidence in, um, in creating remixes of resources, but more than that, she realized the importance of 
re-engaging with the community and giving back. So not just taking from the community, but offering something forward and how that's necessary. So she then adapted the, the original content that Carrie created for um, Austin Community College audiences in Texas, made it a Texas-wide resource. And not only that, but they've been so successful at this, they have new US states asking for remixes of their work, which is just so inspiring wow. to see this kind of ripple effect. And I, I think our facilitators, obviously our participants are um, responsible for this. So I'm, yeah, I'm very grateful for, for all of them. That's great. Lena? You got what some people very of? excited in the chat. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, similar stuff. I mean, I think that I think that we all kind of um, go back to the people who are involved in our programs and and where they go and what new heights they reach. Um, that's the that's where um, all of the um, you know where you get all of your validation from, right? You're like, this is important work. Um, so I actually pulled up a. A testimonial um, from a colleague from Conestoga College in Kitchener, Ontario. Uh, and this is what I'm most proud of. I'm just going to read it. She says, as educators, we're always looking to hone and perfect our craft. The Ontario Extend program challenged me, frustrated me, and in the end helped me grow as an educator. I encourage every educator to work through the entire program at their own pace and come out the other side stronger in their craft. And I think what this, what this encapsulate for me is that what we managed to do with the EXTEND program is create a safe space for people to cross those thresholds of their learning that are so uncomfortable and so difficult. Um, and that's, and Alan will know, you know, we, we worked at this for so long and I'm sure we still don't have it right, but you know, this idea of, of what is a, what does a space look like where people are able to enter into and feel comfortable taking a risk, trying something new, doing the kind of experiential learning, because it's all experiential, our program, doing the kind of experiential learning that really helps them like rethink what it, what am I, what's my job as a teacher? Like, what does that mean? What does that mean to me? What does that mean to our students? And, you know, there, there were so many decisions along the way where we tried to kind of create that bit of a holding environment for people to be able to take those risks. And it's something we're still, we're still grappling with. But this says to me, uh, this quote that we have, um, that we have accomplished that um, for, for a couple of people. And, and I think, Sarah, you were saying, um, you know, Creative Commons license, like there's a lot, right? It's a lot to learn. And tied up in all of that for the Extend program is technology as a scary thing. Like, you know, how do I even start? And how do I find myself in it? And how do I own it? And how do I, how do I create that safe space then for my students? So all of the ripple effects of that are what I'm most proud of. Um, and, um, and these, quote, these testimonials are the thing that I, if I had an office, well, maybe I should just start, maybe this wall behind me is what it needs. I should just start printing them out and putting them up because um, those are the kinds of things that keep us going. Nice. Quill, would you like to say something about this? Sure. So I think one of the things that I'm most proud of in this project are actually the number of people who were willing to share their vulnerabilities in terms of what they didn't know or didn't feel confident about or like were doing but weren't sure that they actually had had the right training to do um, because we asked people to share what are the things you think you need to know to do your position to do your role um, and a lot of people shared a lot of vulnerabilities or a lot of mistakes they had made or a lot of um, opportunities they'd wish they'd had for for professional development and I'm just so very thankful for the community that answered those questions but also really really impressed with the way they wanted to add to the commons and the way they did by sending us like here's the training I built because I didn't know how to do the thing <laughs> um, so I'm really proud of the work that people were willing to give to this work and um, how 
open and how supportive the open community wants to be of new participants in our field. Um, it just impresses me every time somebody sends me a new training and says, hey, would you put this in your list? Um, here's why I think it's valuable. <laughs> that's excellent. Well, that's all very moving. Um, and I can see we're kind of coming down the stretch in terms of the time we have, although I think we could all continue talking for the rest of uh, the, the day. But I'm going to ask one more question of each of you. Um, and this, this, maybe I'll try to kind of integrate or weave in a couple of components to it. Um, one is that we're in the middle of a pandemic. And so I wonder how COVID has or hasn't affected your program. Um, and, and in addition, I would welcome you speaking about what's next, what you have your initiatives underway, what, what do you see on the horizon going forward? And so if you could kind of reference perhaps the horizon going forward and perhaps how it's been affected by the COVID, uh, I think a, a round of uh, statements from each of you on that would be fantastic. And I'll, I'll start with you, Quill, if you're all right with that. Sure. Um, <laughs> so I think um, one of the things that COVID highlighted for us is how much it's possible to get your work sidelined by emergencies and how important it is to be tenacious and optimistic and keep working towards things. Um, I think the um, our next steps revolve a lot around making recommendations to the community in terms of um, what is available, why is it good, um, what will it help you achieve, um, and also finding ways to get that into the hands of people who are interested in doing open education work but don't know how to get started or do not have institutional backup in terms of um, being able to pay for training, right? Because that's one of the dangers of a lot of the professional development that comes with a certificate right now. Um, it's great if you can afford it and it's really hard if you can't. So um, that I think is a big step for us. Um, in the work we need to do as a field. Thank you. Sarah? Um, such a wonderful question. Uh, I, Quill, I really, I loved what you said and um, it really made me think about, um, and I wanna call out someone who's on the call, um, Amanda Coolidge at BC campus is on the call and we, um, ended up looking at, they had created, BC Campus had created an infographic about COVID and, o and OER that we embedded um, in our presentations and our courses. And it really kind of helped us all remember, it's yet one more reason why open is the way to go. Um, so yeah, Amanda, thank you um, to the whole BC Campus team always. Um, I also will say that I think, you know, for us, COVID um, helped us reimagine um, what it means to get together. The OEN has always loved the time that we get together. We used to get together every summer for a week. Um, and it's really helped us reimagine what it is to be together. Um, and I think um, we're learning so much from everyone who is reimagining that including OE Global um, and last week's Open Ed Conference um, and just the tremendous creativity and resilience that the open education community is showing during this time, both in terms of that gathering, but I also think in terms of our um, commitment to keep going. You know, so many people we're frightened away like, oh no, we're, you know, our faculty can't do this right now. And actually we find, we're finding it's quite the opposite um, that faculty are, are banging on the doors of so many of our institutions and members saying, what was that that you told us about? Uh, the open textbook library that the OEM manages has seen record breaking um, numbers of people looking in the library, the growth we're seeing in the textbooks that we're adding. I mean, this is a really, I am an optimistic person. I'm a sunny person, if you know me at all. Everyone on the call who knows me knows. 
But, you know, this is an amazing time to see the way that the open education community and higher ed is rallying around this work. And I'm optimistic about it. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll stop talking. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Jenrin? Yeah, I, so first, I, I agree. I think this this time not to diminish the tremendous suffering and, and challenges that um, and trauma that people are facing, but it seems like this is um, a time that is really ripe with opportunity for open education and open education development. Um, we've seen more people receptive to the ideas of sharing resources. We've seen a swell of support for that initially with the onset of COVID. And I expect that with, with COVID, also with the UNESCO OER recommendation and a number of other factors, this is a really pivotal moment in our kind of our trajectory for open education and, and our development programs in general. So I feel optimistic about that as well. Um, I also, I, I keep reflecting on what's been happening, this kind of, as we mentioned, sort of a ripple effect of um, sharing after getting this expertise in our different trainings and seeing how this ripple effect is, is just growing in our communities is, is really empowering. And so far, this has not been um, intentional on our parts. I mean, we're certainly supporting it, but it hasn't been anything that we have deliberately gone out of our way to, um, to collaborate on or um, to do anything more than perhaps highlight. So in terms of what I see in the future, I would love, love, love to, if others are interested, set up some kind of informal listserv or some other way of connecting these different professional development initiatives and just sharing the opportunities or lessons learned, sharing some things that are really incredible populations are working on so that we can be more intentional about this ripple effect in the future. So far it's been organic, but I think, I think we could see some really wonderful things with a little bit more intentionality. Thank you, Jenrin. We only have a couple of minutes, so I'm gonna ask the remaining speakers to be brief in their remarks. Um, Lena? Sure, Paul, thanks. Um, so a couple of things, um, you know, picking up on Sarah's point about growth um, and COVID had a massive impact on, on Extend. I mean, you can imagine that suddenly a program about digital fluency becomes um, something that is on top of everybody's list because they need all their faculty to know how to teach and learn online. Um, so that was huge for us. I mean, we saw we saw 200% growth and, you know, the a period that was the same as the year before. Um, so that's been that's been great for us. So we're really trying to figure out what does scale look like um, and how do we bring this opportunity to more people? Um, how do we support it for, for the most success? And the things that I'm that I think are the most promising in terms of scale. Um, have to do with recognition of the program formally by um, institutions, um, hopefully around the world, but absolutely in our province. Um, that is something I'm, I'm working on a lot to, to, to make sure that, you know, that the skills that these people are gaining as they go through the program actually mean something as they carry on with their professional life into whatever college or university they want to want to work at. Um, that's a principle of relevance that I believe is really important. The program should have, and the other is mentorship. Um, you know, actually leveraging all of the incredible people that have come through the program that are just dying to share. You know what they've done. Um, how do we support them? Um, what do the incentives? What does the incentive structure look like around them to allow them to then go out and support other educators in the system? So that's another key part of scale that I'm really. Um, um, optimistic about. Thanks. Thank you, Lena. Um, Tanya? I'm just going to do a shameless plug. Uh, if you look at the chat <laughs> in a recent Inside Higher Ed article and a link to the Bayview Analytics um, report that I just did with Jeff Seaman, and we found that OER initiatives work. And so all the things you're doing are working. Just keep doing it. So in this time of pandemic, um, you're asking how it specifically um, is with that. Jeff has got new research that shows that faculty are more receptive 
to digital materials than ever before in history, ever before. This is our moment, people. We, <laughs> OER, initial, OER initiatives work, our, our training is working, and anything you do to help this cause and to empower somebody else, do it. Just do whatever it takes to keep it going. Thank you, Tanya. And Tao, finally. So I agree with what everybody said, and I'll just highlight one thing that's been very important to us because of the pandemic is uh, we've we've had to do a lot of work on showing the difference between open and free. And so uh, we've had an onslaught of, of uh, businesses coming in and showing uh, and offering, you know, platforms and services and under the guise of open and sort of like an open washing. And it's been in a massive scale globally. And so we've had to start a bunch of projects and create resources and videos and and sort of wrap open education about this digital around this digital rights movement and make it an integral part of how we see open education because issues of privacy and data collection for minors and all these things have become such a big part of what we do in open education now that uh, a lot of times you know, this this is just not a topic that we, we talk about. So now it's become a pillar of what we do in open education and we've developed a lot of resources to talk about this. Fantastic. Um, well, I, I want to, on behalf of all of us, uh, the people who are here participating and listening to you all, I just want to thank every single one of you for the effort you've put into creating and hosting and managing and growing these professional development opportunities. I think it's really had a huge impact on the field. I look forward to someday perhaps we'll have like a graduate degree in open education where all these programs are kind of integrated. Um, that's kind of something I can see in the horizon, perhaps not that far away actually. Um, and so uh, thank you all for, for agreeing to be part of this rather large panel and for, uh, for putting, putting up with my facilitation and thank you all to the participants. I encourage, there are a ton of really great resources shared in chat. I really encourage those to be uh, next put up inside OEG Connect. And so, um, those of you that shared them, please go ahead and put those resources up inside the OEJ Connect space for this particular keynote. And thank you all for everything that you're doing. Keep on going, as Tanya says. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. And Paul. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We can end the recording now. Thank you. Thank you all.